give. Um, I've never actually given this talk before, but I wrote it for a conference this summer. I was going to give it at Gamescom, DevCom, and, uh, and it's like the European um, E3, apparently. I didn't end up getting it there, um, and I thought I'd give it here because, well, it, it, it makes references to a lot of gaming stuff. Um, I think that it's um, it's uh, it's pretty applicable to everyone, honestly. So the title in for the talk in Germany was supposed to be from SLOs to GOTY, which means, of course, uh, Game of the Year. But <laughs> I think of it more as just being um, a talk called this, like your system is broken. <laughs> um, I think games are actually a really great example of the kinds of systems that really demand observability and modern best practices because every single player's experience matters. There's a very terrifying asymmetry there where, you know, it's, it's the platform problem all over again where, you know, it may just be one user, you know, out of many tens of thousands, even millions to you, but, you know, to the player, it's their entire world. My name is Charity Meters. I am the um, co-founder and CTO of Honeycomb. I worked at, you know, Facebook, Parse, etc. Um, and uh, my actual, my first real job after dropping out of college was actually at Linden Lab, which, as we would tell you ad nauseum, Second Life is not a game. <laughs> um, but, you know, whatever. Um, also, uh, I co-wrote Database Reliability Engineering and Observability Engineering, which is now out in print. You can also get a free copy from the Honeycomb website. We've been tweeting it out a bunch, so um, if you're interested, um, go get it. So, what do you need to build a winning game? Well, two things, right? You need to have a good game, <laughs> you know, which is, the first part is up to you, right? You want it to be exciting and you want it to be, you know, what people talk about, you know, the gameplay, etc. The second part is, you know, up to the tools and telemetry that you use. It's impossible to not have issues, um, but it is possible to find and fix those issues before users notice. You really want this to be boring, <laughs> taken for granted by users. And, uh, and for that, you know, you rely on your tools and your and your telemetry. Now there are two schools of thought here. There's the metrics and monitoring, which you know have a 20 year history, and then there's observability, which as a staff, software discipline, uh, I only really has about a five year long history. And you know I don't mean just the like slap a new label on your tool and call it observability. Like I mean the real technical definition. Um, monitoring is. Um, is just not good enough. Um, what you need is observability, and SLOs are a really key part of that. So what you really need to know about observability, just to sum it all up very quickly, is, is this. Um, aggregates are bullshit, just in general, um, because every single individual player's experience count. Any one person who can't log in um, can cause misery for you on the forums. Um, you know, you can take a lot of pride in the, in the quality of your system. You, you know, you can be like my system has, you know, four nines and the statement can be true. And yet, you know, um, there can be a whole bunch of pathologies. Everybody who logged in, um, today might have had their, their state save, um, on a, on an unresponsive shard. Um, you know, latency can be timing out, um, payments can be failing, you know, um, there, there's like this infinitely long, thin tail of things that almost never happen that someday will happen and will inev inevitably bite you. Um, and the difference between monitoring and observability here is really that, right? Observability lets you, you know, inspect cause and effect at a very granular level. It, it connects um, effort to output. It connects cause to effect and it helps you iterate and improve on what works using, you know, a magnifying glass, if, if you want to think of it that way. Um, without observability, um, you are really driving blind. You're careening down the freeway without your glasses on. <laughs> and um, 
observability is really what makes this engineering, not just operations. Um, and when you apply like the principles of observability specifically to, you know, game development, it's can you understand what's happening inside your games just by asking questions from the outside? Can you can you debug your code, reconstruct user experience, you know, can you can you peek under the hood? Can you understand new scenarios? Not just, you know, like the of course, this is borrowed from, you know, mechanical engineering where, you know, it, observability is the mathematical dual of controllability and it re refers to your ability to, you know, understand what's happening inside the system just by looking at from the outside the system. And not only that, but understanding these scenarios without shipping new code. Because if you had to be able to, you know, understand it in advance before you could understand it, um, that's obviously not observability. And if you can't see it, you really can't improve it. Not consistently anyway. You might be able to, you know, squeeze out some some wins by sheer luck, but you can't consistently improve. And games are honestly some of the first problems to run up against these, you know, these intense performance limits, you know, the 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 hard limits of low cardinality instrumentation, in part because of, you know, these really complex far-flung distributed, you know, architectures spanning, you know, multiple clouds, multiple data centers, multiple regions, you know, designed by teams all over the world having to collaborate together, you know, played using thousands of design, device types. And, and, you know, they have concurrency problems from hell because, you know, it's down to the second, right? No matter where you are in the world, you know, if you're, if you're like, if you're firing your gun, you want it to, you know, be your blah, 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 which is, this is why I feel like, you know, it's super important for us to establish right up front that all systems are broken, <laughs> but especially large systems, right? It exists in this continuous state of partial degradation. Um, there are so many bugs embedded in your system right now. And it's a testament to the engineering of, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, which means that hardly any of them ever matter until they do. Um, like only a very, very small fraction of the software system problems and bugs uh, ever actually need to be closely understood. But that tiny percentage has an outsized effect on the success of your business and the happiness of your users. And the tricky part is you can never predict in advance what they're going to be. Like you just, you don't have access to that knowledge. And uh, it's not just about, you know, is it broken? It's not just about getting the site back up. It's not just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's also about how does this work, right? It's, it's not just finding the problems. It's also understanding, you know, because often, you know, the things that we think of as bugs might not even be bugs. They're just behaviors. Right. And so the better we get at seeking out these weird, you know, overlapping, you know, performance um, intersections and and edge cases and weirdnesses like the the better we get at using our tools to introspect our systems, um, the better off you will be. So back to the like observability, like the first principles of observ observability are as such. Um, it's not observability if it doesn't support high cardinality, high dimensionality, uh, explorability. It's, if it has a schema, it's not observability because schemas implied you could predict up front the shape of the data and the important things that you are going to need to understand or collect. Um, uh, an important facet of observability is that it bundles the full context of the request and it, and it like persists it across network hop so that you can do things like tracing, for example. Uh, I've written about this ad nauseum, so I'm going to skip right through this pretty quickly, but I just want to quickly note, if all that you're running are metrics based tools, you can't have, you will not achieve observability. Um, if you're, you know, doing your right time aggregation, you're not going to make, a, you're not going to have observability and it has nothing to do with pillars. So that's clear. Uh, the fundamental building block of a metric is 
of, of the modern tools is the metric. And the metric is just one number with some tags appended to it, right? Um, contrast that with um, the building blocks of um, observability. Well, you know, it's a, the fundamental building block of observability is the arbitrarily wide structured data blob, or some people call these canonical log lines. And it can have, you know, hundreds of key value pairs. It can, you know, the whole point of it is you can just throw on more data whenever you feel like it. Oh, this might be useful someday. Let's capture it, right? Um, if you have to rely on, you know, metrics, logs, etc., you're going to end up finding most of your problems when customers complain, which is terrible for a lot of reasons. It's terrible because most users don't complain, that which means by definition, you're only ever hearing about a very small percentage of the users who are experiencing problems. Um, you know, and most of these bugs will never even show up in any kind of staging environment. Um, and, and, you know, complexity is, you know, the complexity of our systems. It used to just be that we had the monolith, right? And most of the complexity was bound up inside the monolith. And um, that's, that's really not the case anymore. Our complexity continues to explode um, and our, our tools need, need to catch up, which is why, you know, we need to aggressively shift our fo focus away from, you know, feeling like writing tests can save us. Tests are great. I am not shitting on tests at all. Um, but, um, we do need to, we do need to, um, accept that like testing in production is a thing, right? It's not a question of if you test in production or not, everybody tests in production. Um, the only question is whether or not you're going to admit it and do it well, or if you're just going to live in a state of denial and, and pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, so what's the solution to all this? Um, you know, our tools have historically been designed to answer, you know, known unknowns, and they did a good, good, good job of that. But our new problems are mostly problems of unknown unknowns, you know, like, um, you know, uh, our photos are loading slowly, you know, but only for some people. We aren't sure which people, but it's definitely some, right? Um, so how do we, how do we address this? Well, it starts with um, writing your code with instrumentation, um, shipping and deploying absolutely as quickly as you can, and, and using SLOs. Um, I think of this as like, you want production to feel as much like a REPL as possible, right? Like, REPL is like the programmer shell, right? You should be able to, you know, and there will always be a bit of a lag time. I, I feel like 15 minutes is kind of the, the ideal that I've spent a lot of time pushing, but like, if you can shorten that feedback loop um, so that you're you're writing code, you're waiting a few minutes, and it's live in production, and you're you're going, you're looking at it while it's you know fresh in your head, and you're asking yourself, does you know does anything look weird? Um, well, here's a longer version of that, right? Um, really, it's about empowering software engineers to own their own code, right? And the way that you own your own code in production is by instrumenting as you go, right? Um, never accept a pull request unless you can explain how am I going to be able to tell if this breaks, right? Something that um, I really like that the engineers have started doing here is every time that you have a pull request, you have to, there's a field where you explain how you're going to know if it breaks and, um, and what your instrumentation is. Um, you uh, deploys are really the fulcrum point of your system, right? That's where the power sits. If you can ship software well and reliably, you know, if you can cultivate it as a muscle memory of going and checking on your code after you shipped it, um, you can probably catch like upwards of 80% of all problems before your users do, which is, this is the goal, right? Catching before the users do. Um, Tight feedback loops with fast deploys are absolutely killer here. They're absolutely the key because um, the amount of time that it takes you to find and fix your bugs goes up exponentially from the moment that you write it, right? So you write it, you write a bug, you backspace, great. You just fixed it as fast as anyone can possibly fix it, right? But once that code gets rolled out to production and you move on, 
somebody else is going to find it. Like it gets slower and slower and harder and harder. And um, it just, it's, it's really hard. So like the, the, the ideal form of, of deploying is, I think, I feel like to deploy multiple times a day and de to deploy just one merch set by one developer at a time. Um, this is, this is, this is how, what's going to like connect you with the consequences of your code as quickly as possible. Um, the other, the other key thing is to, of course, run your systems with SLOs. Um, and SLOs, I think of them as being like the API of your engineering team, right? It, between management and engineering and operations, everybody's got these awkward questions for each other about, you know, how broken is too broken? What does good enough mean? Um, alert fatigue and everything. Like, you know, SLOs, uh, you know, the point of SLOs is that you basically, given any event, you categorize it as, is it eligible? And if so, is it good? And an SLO is basically just a minimum quality ratio over a period of time. Your error budget is the number of bad events that are allowed. Um, yours might be like, you know, 99% of game state should save in under two seconds. 99.9% .9 of logins should succeed in under five seconds. And 99.9% .9 of requests to an endpoint uh, return true or return 200. <laughs> right? These are the honeycomb SLOs. Um, we think the most critical thing of all is that we get the data out of our customer's RAM and onto disk in honeycomb as quickly as possible. Uh, the second most important thing is that um, queries are fast um, and other requests don't actually matter that much. So, you know, this, this helps us prioritize. Um, <laughs> oops, my tweet. A, a, a system of even moderate correct complexity is always down, right? Um, and this means that, you know, the struggle is not to prevent bugs from happening. The struggle is to find them before our users do again. And if you think that your system isn't broken, it probably just means your tools are bad. Um, because, you know, your system is never actually really up. Um, so traditionally, you know, we have, in, in engineering, we have addressed this with monitoring checks, right? Instead of SLOs. and Monitoring checks is, are especially, you know, traditionally done for symptoms, right? So like your disk is filling up or CPUs are running hot or, you know, you've got an error, you know, you've got a certain percentage of error requests or your pushes are, are growing. Um, this is how we used to do checks, um, but it scales terribly. It does not scale well at all. If you just keep adding more and more checks, your team is, is, their brain is going to explode. They're not going to be able to keep up. They're not going to be able to get any sleep. Um, and it's just going to get noisier and noisier. So instead of like, instead of alerting on hundreds or thousands of symptom-based monitoring checks, um, we suggest that you pick a few precious, precious SLIs, SLOs that directly reflect your user's pain um, and track those. Um, and now let's look at how this becomes magical when you combine with observability, right? So some examples of SLOs, right? This is this is the Honeycomb SLO, um, just for example. You don't have to use Honeycomb for this, but like, you know, a key function of um, SLOs and how they work are you've got a budget, right? And, and so like this lets you visualize how quickly you're spending down your budget and how much of the error budget remains. Um, and um, in Honeycomb, it looks like this. And then historical SLO compliance, like for each day of the past 30, like how have we done, right? How often has our SLA succeeded? Um, and then when we combine this uh, with, with um, observability, like, Traditionally, you know, using monitoring tools and, and telemetry tools, you know, you've had to, you, the human, are sitting here in the middle of a collection of tools, just kind of like holding your finger in the bookmark and trying to match, okay, you know, 8 p.m., 8, 19, 
is that the same spike as 818 or the clock skews, right? Or like what? But like the only connective tissue has been you, right? The person in the middle. Um, the beautiful thing about observability is that because it relies on these arbitrarily wide structured data blobs, you know, these very rich events, um, you can actually go from very high level, you know, aggregate down to very specific, okay, out of the errors, out of the errors, like what do they all have in common? What dimensions do they all have in common? Or, you know, what is the new thing that is affecting them or, or whatever it is, right? You can go up and down and back and forth. So Poodle is our, our front end um, service. <laughs> all of our honeycomb services are named after dogs, by the way. Um, and uh, and so you can see how like, you know, um, this is this is the Poodle, you know, budget burn down. Um, and then and then um, what you can do is you can you can actually if you scroll below this, um, you can see the heat map the distribution of all the events, you know, that succeeded or, or failed the SLI, um, distributed by duration. And if you scroll down below this, um, what's cool is it, uh, it's actually showing you, you know, the, the yellow and the blue, it's actually showing you um, what the outliers were, right? So for all of the failing errors, for all of the failing, for all of the requests that failed the SLI, what did they have in common? Well, it looks like, you know, they were all, um, they all had the um, 500 and 400 error response, that tracks. Um, they all have these specific app errors. Um, they all have, um, you know, there's a few things that they all have in common. And so then you can group by any of these to see, um, see like what it is or isn't that they have a problem but but you can see like super obviously here that like all the ones that are failing um happen to have this error code could not find team right um so like i said this is the honeycomb's uh visualization of it but if you use an observability tool using structured wide events you know schemalessness um uh, you should be able to compute and, and, you know, extract your SLOs from that data um, and and have this kind of seamless, like, diving down into it. And in, in summary, like, you, you have an observable system when your team can quickly and reliably diagnose, like, anything new that's happening in your system or any problematic behavior or any user report with no prior knowledge, right? It's not like it used to be where you kind of needed to break the system in, right? You needed to get used to the system. You, so, that, you know, you could, you knew how the system was going to fail the same ways over and over, right? Um, nowadays, every time you get paged, it should honestly be, be for something completely different. You shouldn't be getting paged for the same thing over and over again. Um, and observability is, you know, the way that puts you in like constant conversation with your code. Um, and when you combine it with SLOs and when you combine it with some proactivity, um, you know, you can't, you can't just sit there and wait for the pager to, to, to go off anymore. Like this is the trade-off, right? The, you should get paged a lot less often, um, an order of magnitude less often, typically. Like typically when people move from symptom-based alerts to SLOs, they delete 90% of their alerts. Um, so you get paged way less often, but the trade-off is, um, you can't just sit there and passively wait for things to show up. You need to go and look at your code in production and ask ask yourself, is it doing anything weird? You know, is it doing what I expected it to? Um, and and by consistently doing that, going and looking at your code in production and, and asking yourself these questions, that's how you get to jump on glitches. Um, tighten up your feedback loop, right? Replace your floods with a few well-chosen SLOs, watch your code as it goes out, find the errors before the, your users do. That's the magic. Um, you know, the moral of the story is that, you know, your system is broken. It's always broken. It's always been broken. And it will always be broken. And, and that's actually okay. With the right instrumentation and the right practices, um, you can find the balance between 
you know, building systems that are reliable enough and resilient enough uh, for a user to have a good experience and for you to sleep through the night. The end.